What is unfolding in the dystopian surveillance state and open-air prison that is the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region is considered one of the worst human rights abuses in the world today. Anywhere from 1 to 3 million people, including Uyghurs, Kazakhs, Tajiks, and other ethnic minorities, are forcibly confined to the Xinjiang province by the authoritarian Chinese government, simply because they speak a different language and embrace a different culture. Through discussions about digital authoritarianism, Uyghur forced labor, and personal detention stories, academics, journalists, and activists in this episode provide a multi-dimensional understanding of the genocide unfolding in the Xinjiang region today and offer concrete ideas on how listeners can help stand up against these atrocities. Welcome to Dissidents and Dictators, a series of conversations by the Human Rights Foundation dedicated to exposing and challenging authoritarianism around the world. This episode was recorded during a two-day event series co-hosted by the Human Rights Foundation and Harvard University called Genocide in the 21st Century, the Uyghur Crisis. For more information on HRF's work in this area, please visit our website at hrf.org. Welcome to our fourth and final session in this set of panels we've been doing on the Uyghur issue and Uyghur advocacy more general, uh, more generally. Today, our final panel, panel is Silence is Not an Option, Advocacy and Action, and we're going to be discussing what the future of the Uyghur community looks like. Uh, the Chinese government has been committing a number of uh, atrocities with impunity against the Uyghur community. Uh, but we've been seeing a, a surge in the pushback over the past few months and the last couple of years. Um, and today here I'm joined by three wonderful activists who have been spearheading that uh, pushback in many ways. Uh, first, Johar Lam, who is the daughter of Uyghur academic Lam Toti, who was arrested as he attempted to leave uh, China for an academic position in the US. And Johar actually moved here, uh, well, moved there, I'm not in the US currently, uh, but moved to the US uh, herself after that. Uh, she's also the author of uh, Joher Lam, a Uyghur's fight to free her father. Um, and then Gultara Hoya, who is a Uyghur journalist at Radio Free Asia. She's also a Oslo freedom speaker. Uh, and she's met with Secretary of State Michael, former Secretary of State Michael Pompeo in the past to discuss the Uyghur issue uh, and has written extensively on the subject. And finally, Irad, Irada Kashkari, sorry for that, Irada Kashkari, um, who is an um, Uyghur American activist and also a Human Rights Foundation Freedom Fellow. Uh, she is also the co-founder of a very interesting initiative called the Anna Kirang Education Uyghur Program uh, that promotes uh, learning the Uyghur language and Uyghur culture for members of the Uyghur diaspora uh, in the US. And yeah, that's, that's my very basic introduction of the US, but I'd love to uh, hear yourselves introducing yourselves more, more appropriately. Uh, so if any of you want to start or otherwise, if, uh, Jill Kerr, if you'd like to kick us off. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, introduction. Sorry, I'm hearing an echo. Uh, am I the only one? No, you're not the only one here in the feedback. Yeah, it might be. Uh, just if you might have it checked if you have two tabs open, sometimes uh, there can be multiple tabs open of the same window and it'll create a feedback. Try it again. How about now? I think you're good. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you for, 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 for your help. I'm a, like a dinosaur. I am, I'm very bad at techno anything tech related. Um, hello everyone, my name is Jawhar Ilham and um, I am an Uyghur rights advocate and author and a researcher. Um, I, I'd just like to share, uh, start by sharing a little bit of my personal stories and how and why I became an advocate. So when I was a kid, I uh, thought I wanted to be a dancer or a translator. Uh, then a whole lots of things happened and it disrupted my plans. As you can see, I'm doing something totally unrelated. 
I happen to be the daughter of um, Ilham Tohti, who some of you may know, for those who don't know, um, my father, Ilham Tohti, is a well-known Uyghur economist who is serving now serving a life sentence in China for uh, fostering dialogue between the Han Chinese and the Uyghur people, and also for advocating um, respect for religious and cultural beliefs for our people and for equal opportunities in uh, pursuing the dream, our dreams and the things that uh, motivate us. So, uh, so on 2000, on February 2nd, 2013, my father and I were on our way to America together and he was to become a visiting scholar and at Indiana University in the US. And he was stopped at the airport and prevented from leaving the country. And I was a teenager, a freshman uh, uh, in college studying Arabic, hoping to become a translator. And I was only planning to stay in the U.S. for two or three weeks and help my father settle down. But I'm, as you can see, I'm still here and never left. Uh, I'm currently on the other side of the world, away from my family and my home. And that was the last time I saw my father and my younger brothers. After I left the country, uh, my father was put under house arrest for about 11 months. And it wasn't the first time he was put under house arrest. Uh, he used to always tell me, it's okay, it's okay. And he would just continue his work and I would remain silent. And on January 15th, 2014, which is 11 months after I said goodbye to my father at the Beijing International Airport, he was taken away and disappeared for more than three months. And that was the time I knew it wasn't okay anymore and I couldn't remain silent. I was left with no choice. So you see, uh, the motivation to do the work I do today is very personal. And up to 2017, I was mainly advocating for my father and for my family. But when I learned that hundreds of thousands of families were experiencing similar or even worse treatment, that was a time I, I knew that it wasn't okay anymore and I couldn't remain silent. So here I want to ask people who are listening to this event, uh, what motivates you and why did you join this panel today, this, this event today, and what triggers you to not remain silent? So if you um, can answer those questions, you already have a direction, a direction and goal, and that's the start of every advocacy, of every uh, uh, activism work. And I personally have a very clear direction and a clear goal, and I'm working towards it. My goal is very simple, but very difficult to achieve, which is to release my father and change the lives of millions of Uyghurs and uh, other Muslim minorities who are now suffering from repression inside and outside of China. Even if I can't, I, let's say we can't save their lives, but at least I want to be able to work towards a change and put light in their heart and give them hope so they believe one day this will end. And that's something that I believe too. There's no eternity for, for everything. And I believe this day will end. Thank you. Okay, now I'm not muted. Uh, thanks for that uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, and I think you make a great point about uh, identifying what's pushing you forward towards advocacy and sadly away from uh, dance, but still, uh, I'd love to hear from you, Raid, and uh, also uh, from Wulchera, what pushes you both towards advocacy in this area, as well as just that more for my interaction. So uh, if uh, Wulchera, you'd like to go first. So much for this uh, opportunity to speak to all of you. And uh, really nice to meet you all, Irada and Jawhar. Um, so uh, I just want to uh, introduce me very shortly. I'm a Uyghur journalist. My name's uh, Gulcik Rahoja. I am um, working with uh, Radio Free Asia based on Washington, DC. I've been working there uh, this year going to be 20 years. So uh, in exile, uh, this 20 years has been separated with a family. 
uh, because of our work, um, Chinese government targeted our family since just I start right after I start work in Radio Free Asia. Um, because uh, Radio Free Asia is the only news outlet for Uyghurs inside and outside China in the international level. So I was a TV person back home uh, when I was uh, in Urumqi. I create a Uyghur children program uh, first ever um, in 2000, in 1996. And I become, quickly become a TV um, star actually. So after five, six years, I feel uh, I've been using um, by Chinese government as uh, uh, like propaganda tool. And uh, the time in 2001, I had the chance to uh, visit other country. So I went to Europe and then um, I decided to not go back, uh, work for uh, freedom of press or uh, just uh, freedom of uh, my life. So I connect with the contact with the RFA we were service so they hired me. Since 2001 I uh, working as a journalist and the TV host in Radio Free Asia. Uh, over the last several uh, years, Chinese security has created an uh, <clears throat> uh, unprecedented um, and a far-reaching high-tech uh, policy state in the Uyghur region. Uh, Uyghurs and the other uh, minorities in the uh, our homeland is Turkestan, Chinese called Xinjiang Uyghur Afternoon Region. Um, authorities um, uh, refer to as a, a re-education camps, a mass scales of uh, um, uh, effort to uh, ex uh, ex extinguish um, the culture and our religious identities among Uyghurs as well as other Muslim minorities. RFA Uyghur Service has been at the forefront of uh, covering this crisis. Uh, first, uh, uncovering the mass detention and then the, uh, continuing to uh, breaking the uh, critical developments about the uh, unfolding crisis that has uh, resulted in the detentions and um, of an uh, estimated more than um, 3 million right now uh, individuals. Um, because of our work, uh, Chinese government wants to silence us. That's why they targeting all uh, our Uyghur journals family back home. Also me and my other uh, seven colleagues, uh, family members uh, was um, run up to the re-education camps. Uh, so uh, my uh, brother was taken in 2017 September because of my work. And that time, because my mother was asking me not to, uh, not to speak about that. So, so I didn't, um, you know, call help from anywhere. But as today's topic, silence, not an option. Uh, in my experience, um, several months passed, they didn't release my brother. Um, after several months, 2018, uh, end of January, they um, arrest all my relatives, including my parents, uh, 24 other um, people. So after that, I start raising my voice. I uh, start talking about my personal story in this genocide. So uh, because of our 
uh, RFA uh, report. Uh, so other media outlet also um, uh, start concern um, over the issue uh, in the Uyghur region. What's uh, what's the reality what's the behind the wall so we breaking so much a uh, story ourselves and with other uh international media uh so such as um like um, the family separation policy and the mass transfer of uh prisoners to the other uh uh proven uh Han chinese cities and um, the, the force um, uh, separation force uh, sterilization in the camp all those story we were the first who broke uh, broken this uh, stories to the world so uh, because of our work uh, they want to silence us uh, but silence is not the option. Uh, only because of um, we raise the voice activists uh, as the Johar, as the Irada, uh, many others uh, uh, raising the wars in the free world. That's why today um, our situation known by internationally. And uh, finally, some countries already announced what Chinese government doing in the Uyghur region to the Uyghur other uh, minority is genocide. So about the 11 million, um, millions of Uyghurs suffer under uh, extremely harsh condition in the world's uh, worst Orwellian mass surveillance police state uh, with over uh, one to three million locked away now in the concentration camps and another 1.5 million uh, arbitrarily detained in the prison to keep the world quiet about the uh, uh, emergency uh, of the thousands of concentration camps on the earth china even export its uh, operation to the thousands in the Uyghur diaspora and uh, uh, intentionally causes uh, psychological trauma uh, by the threatening, arresting, and the torturing our relatives to silence us. That is what uh, China did to me and to others. But uh, when they arrested all my family members to stop my reporting inside the US, I choose not to be silenced. Not long ago, because of that Chinese government put me in the wanted list, some kind of wanted list as a terrorist. <laughs> um, to keep the secret, the world largest mass uh, uh, incur uh, and Chris, I, I don't know how to uh, pronounce this. Um, In, incarceration? Know, or incarceration <laughs> of the minority populations. Thank you. Since World War II, uh, China also, um, uh, you know, uh, effectively uh, intimidates the world's governments into silence either the fear or uh, retribution or the hope for possible financial gain keeps the world from the effective addressing its commitment to never again the genocide even here even everywhere <laughs> so uh, not to keep silence is the only way to fight with um, the evil who doing genocide. Um, so uh, I want to, if you want to listen, I want to uh, give you more uh, information about uh, what, uh, you know, look at what is happening to the Uyghurs in the Uyghur region, uh, particularly um, what happened to the Uyghur woman today.
So um, I, you know, welcome everybody uh, could uh, ask anything uh, about uh, information, what's going on in the Uyghur region. I will happy to answer you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that great introduction. Uh, and I, for one, I'm glad you are refusing to stay silent in the face of constant uh, state-sponsored harassment. Uh, before we dive into uh, the broader conversation, I do want to uh, give you rather a chance to introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your own background. And then we'll circle back to the discussion of what's actually happening in the Uyghur region today and what we can do about it. So, Rada. Um, all right. Uh, thank you so much. Can you guys hear me? I wasn't sure if I was still on mute. Okay, great. Um, well, yeah, thank you. Uh, it's an honor to be here, especially with uh, Gijeka and Jauhad here, whose stories have, you know, been such a highlight and such a inspiration for us to keep going forward. Um, my story kind of starts off a slightly differently in that I never really got the chance to live in the Uyghur region. I left when I was about three and a half years old um, because of my parents who, uh, after the Wulja massacre in 1997, um, who were pressured to leave the region. And like most immigrant families that settle in America were, you know, hoping for a better future for me, for an easier future for me. Um, and they did that. They gave that service of, you know, providing this atmosphere for me where I could speak my mind, where I can learn what I need to and uh, pursue my dreams while having the safety of my mom and dad here, my siblings here, uh, without the pressure of the Chinese government that they grew up in. That being said, uh, my parents had instilled in me from a young age that they grew up in an increasingly worse situation. So ever since I was little in the United States, we had been speaking out about you know, the Chinese government and where the, their oppression of the Uyghurs were escalating. Um, so this was early 2000s that people had already been warning about the upcoming situation. They said that it was getting worse. And uh, in 2016, 2017, that happened. Um, for me personally, this wasn't a big part of my childhood. Uh, being Uyghur was something that, you know, I knew that I would have to call family back home so that I can talk to my grandparents and my aunts and uncles to make my parents happy. It wasn't necessarily something that uh, was in, you know, a huge forefront of my life. It was the food at home. It was, you know, the weddings that we would go to, the cultural weddings. It was those things. It was these happy things uh, that I always associated it with. Um, but slowly I began to realize, you know, as I distanced myself from my culture, I didn't really know the language. Um, and I noticed that other young people were also feeling more and more distant. Um, and that other, you know, people who came from the region, from the Uyghur region, they felt distance. They felt very similarly as I do, that they can't really grasp the language. They didn't really understand the culture. They felt very isolated from being an Uyghur. And, um, you know, as you grow older, there's a sense of knowing your roots. There's there's a feeling of wanting to go back to your homeland. And that happened to me in 2015. I was like about to graduate college and I wanted to travel and I wanted to go back to my roots. I wanted to figure out where my family came from. And when I graduated college in 2016, there was no absolute way of me ever going back. It had been 20 something years. I had grown outside of the region and never been able to go back to my homeland to see where my parents grew up, to see my neighborhood, to see my uh, extended family members. That never was an opportunity. And I realized that the people back there, back in the Uyghur region also didn't have that opportunity. As the oppression was growing, the language was getting uh, consistently removed from uh, every possible manner up to the education. You know, people were no longer learning Uyghur on a daily basis. And um, the origin of the Uyghur culture was being completely destroyed. And I realized that at that point that the diaspora was really important, that maybe this is something I can do as an extremely ordinary American girl, that maybe this is something that I can at least contribute to a little. And in 2017, my mother and I started the Uyghur Language School uh, in Northern Virginia. Um, this was a way for me to, you know, really connect with these kids that similar to me grew up far away from home, never getting the chance or the opportunity to go back and visit. 
uh, to really recognize where they're from and recognize their roots. And uh, we've been going strong with that. Um, but unfortunately, as you get involved into the culture, you hear more of the stories. You hear why people care about being Uyghur, why people felt so isolated for so long. And a lot of them have stories like Gunjekha and Jahed. And one after another, it's heartbreaking. And so there was no way that you could stay silent. And um, there was no way that you could continue, especially from my point of view, where I had nothing to lose. You know, both my parents had been active uh, in the diaspora. So our family back home had already seen the worst. Uh, anything I did would only be contributing. And I, you know, it was nothing brave of me to speak out because I was privileged. And um, I recognized that. And so I started speaking out. I started taking that opportunity to say something, to start speaking to congressmen and women, start uh, organizing at events, and uh, start educating more and more people. And um, to be honest, I know Jeff had earlier asked, what's the motivation? My motivation is really to be able to set foot in my land, in my homeland, where my parents were born, where I was born, to be able to <clears throat> see that land that we hear so much about. Um, my goal is to safely be able to set foot there again without having the Chinese government harass us, without having the Chinese government, you know, be able to threaten us and to make us fear going back home. And that's my selfish motivation. But on a bigger aspect, it's the fact that an authoritarian government like the, Chi like the Chinese government with Xi Jinping as a lifetime president, that's frightening. If they take control, if they become a world leader, then what does that mean for the rest of the countries that are also struggling with authoritarianism? What does that mean for the rule of law and the freedom to speak out? What does that mean on a global stance? And I think um, that's the more uh, the bigger picture, right? And uh, the bigger picture motivation for me. Thank you. No, thank you for sharing that uh, beautiful story of reclaiming your Uyghur heritage. Uh, I actually want to circle uh, back to that uh, before asking you guys about what do you think the future of the Uyghur community looks like. Uh, I'd love to hear from uh, whoever is willing to share something, uh, something about the beauty and the happiness of Uyghur culture, right? Something about the what you were fighting for, the, the, the beauty within that, aside from the grief, which is also very relevant. Uh, so if any of you would like to share a, a specific cultural tradition that you're fond of or uh, any specific element, that'd be great. Uh, if anyone is eager to answer that. I, I can start off uh, just from my very uh, outward, outward understanding of it. Um, again, since I didn't grow up in the region, I can't speak for exactly what it's like, but from the stories that I've heard, from everything that I've heard, first of all, the land, the beautiful, beautiful land. Um, the natural resources, the lakes, the rivers, the mountains. I think um, people don't realize that we're not just a country of victims, right? Of victims of communism, but we're we're a beautiful land with so many resources. And you know, I myself am a huge hiker, and you know, just being able to hike in my home country that would be amazing. And then the other aspect of it, of the beauty, is the kindness of Uyghurs. Uh, I was always told. Um, that if you go back to uh, occupied East Turkestan, that people will be inviting you over left and right. People will be so welcoming and that you can go to dinner at five different houses in one night and you know everyone will be like, oh, you have to try this, you have to do this. And very, very welcoming culture. And um, neighbors are living together like family and you know, you need anything from someone, someone's gonna take care of your kids here. Something very that very different from how I grew up. And I think that was something that I really wanted. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that was the beauty of it. And in the diaspora, I've seen a lot of that too. You know, the tight knit community that I grew up in uh, of such helpful people, such kind people, people willing to, you know, go backwards for you, you know, they'll, they'll bend over backwards for you. Um, they'll, you know, if you need to go to a doctor's appointment, if you need help with your childcare stuff, these are things that the community has always been very thoughtful about. And um, growing up, I saw that. And I think um, that really puts a big uh, inspiration on why the Uyghurs are worth saving. Thank you. I, I just want to point out because uh, three of the speakers today, uh, that we was all women uh, today. So 
uh, important role a uh, woman play in the Uyghur society. I just want to mention something. Uh, there is a traditional saying, uh, an Uyghur woman uh, rocks a, a cradle with the left hand while she rocks the world with her right. Uh, that's what um, we Uyghur women uh, must do now as our people struggle just to exist. Because um, we only have two options right now. One is becoming Chinese or die. So we must uh, preserve a future for our people while moving the world to continue, uh, convince China to allow Uyghurs such a basic freedom as a life and the liberty. The Uyghurs, about 11 million of Uyghurs, um, we are Turkic speaking Muslim people. So in our culture is very unique combination with so much, uh, you know, culture. Um, because our land um, is neighboring with eight different countries. It was the uh, it was the uh, the center of uh, historic um, Silk Road. That's why the multicultural uh, environment um, in the Uyghur region uh, so creates so much beautiful, uh, you know, uh, culture and. Um, uh, after Chinese government uh, took over our country, uh, uh, which is called uh, New Frontier, uh, Frontier, uh, Frontier, right? New Frontier, uh, the Xinjiang, uh, the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, since occupied it in uh, 1949. Um, uh so after that uh it's um, a cultural uh revolution was happening also in the Uyghur region that time our elites was arrested uh so many of them uh, killed by chinese government after that uh you know after 10 years the revolution passed, we have a little gap to develop our uh, language, our life, everything uh, between um, like 70s, 80s, uh, 1980s to 2000. But after 2000, Chinese government's policy toward Uyghurs completely changed. You know, they used uh, so-called bilingual education system to assimilate our generation. The that time I was working in Xinjiang TV as a producer and host. I was grown up with very artistic environment because my grandpa is the who established first ever Uyghur cultural center in the Uyghur Afternoon region. So I grown up with all the stars, you know, the um, singers, dancers, music, everything. So as we were children, uh, you know, we uh, just start to speak, we can sing. We just uh, start to walk, we can dance <laughs> just like that. So because the happy people, be because who have love inside, they can express, who have free mind they can express uh, with dance, with music, right? That's why our culture is very uh, unique and uh, different from other Muslim countries, I think. Um, <clears throat> so um, after Chinese government, you know, 40 years of uh, occupancy and uh, using this assimilation, uh, because of the religion, because of the strong 
uh, culture. That's why we are survived. Um, Chinese government uh, already notice if we don't eliminate um, culture, language, and their beliefs, which is our din. Um, <clears throat> so they cannot fully, you know, assimilate our generation. That's why this uh, camp is the, the systematic, you know, uh, the eliminate. Uh, Uyghurs, uh, all they have, so very different from Han Chinese. So it's like very um, systematic uh, policy. Um, it's even uh, not similar to uh, to the historic, you know, never again. It's actually more. It's uh, we are eliminate physically. Uh, and um, uh, psychologically and culturally, everything. It's like cultural genocide. It's like uh, a, a religion genocide. It's all, also physically genocide. So, uh, but we, we were proud of to be who we are. That's why we still you know, standing still fighting. So who lives abroad right now? Everybody's like fighter because we have freedom. We have chance, but back home, millions of our people even doesn't have a voice, doesn't have a opportunity to speak to anyone to ask help. So we are the hope. We are the only uh, hope for them. So we cannot stop. As Irada says, my children also struggling, even they're uh, born in US, they are struggling to find out their identity, you know, because they never been to Uyghur region and uh, truly, you know, experiencing what is the Uyghur's life. Uh, even they didn't see until now their, grandparents uh, because of Chinese government doesn't grant them passport to travel and they don't allow us to go there. So the separation also is the very big crisis among the uh, exile Uyghurs today. So, uh, but we have hope. We're never gonna stop as this uh, to my lovely sister says, we're gonna fight together. Um, so uh, today, even um, the Harvard uh, st uh, students uh, willing to uh, listening to us, it's also giving us hope. That means a lot. That means a lot. Thank you so much. It's, uh, I mean, it's not exactly a pleasure because it's very regrettable that this is a situation to begin with, uh, but certainly urgently necessary. Um, I, I really uh, enjoyed your point about the, the formation of a, a cultural identity despite the separation because I know you rather brought, brought it up earlier, this feeling within the diaspora. I wanted to ask all of you, uh, starting with Johan, because you didn't speak in the last round, uh, and also because your personal experience is probably very relevant here. Um, how have you managed to stay in touch with your cultural identity and to form a community around that identity amidst all this chaos and pressure uh, from the state? Um, first of all, I wanted to bring up that I was born and raised in Beijing, so the capital of China. Growing up, um, I met my father's students, we were students, but um, I wasn't, uh, I didn't get a chance to really study the language like most of the, we were uh, kids did when they were back in the Uyghur region and I could only speak like a five-year-old um, uh, My Uyghur language language school was really pretty pretty bad because I never got to systematic systematically learn it in school so My way of um, connecting myself to my root after coming to the US was I took Uyghur class in college and um, And I think that is one of the best decision I have ever made um, 
I can't say I'm full, completely perfect in Uyghur language, but I have definitely improved and gotten better compared to before I could read and write and uh, hear uh, and, and listen. So for anyone who is interested in learning Uyghur language, you you uh, you have you may be able to take classes at Indiana University. They have uh, language programs for summer uh, language programs. So anyone can take it. And even in Harvard, I think there's Uyghur language classes as well. So um, if anyone is interested, it's a very beautiful language. The grammar system is fascinating. Um, I personally love languages. I, as I mentioned earlier, I want grow up wanting to be a translator. And though I'm, I'm, I'm not going to probably not ever going to be a translator in the future, but I still, my love, my passion for languages never stopped. And, um, um, but my way of connecting to my root is to, you know, learn my language. And also I cook Uyghur food at home. Uh, before coming to the U.S., I did not know even how to make salad, Uyghur salad. So, but now I make all the traditional Uyghur cuisine. I actually, I even, <laughs> it's a funny thing that I wrote in my upcoming book that, I used to, when I was in college, when I was in Indiana University studying there, there were lots of Chinese students there. So I would cook Uyghur food. So in China, they're trying to assimilate the Uyghur people to become Han Chinese. And what I can do, at least I can assimilate their stomach to the Uyghurs, Uyghur stomach. So I used to uh, invite some of my Chinese friends and make them eat my Uyghur dishes. And um, I try to eat as, as Uyghur food as often as I can. And maybe you can see from uh, Gujarat's um, background. There's a Uyghur a rug that is hung, hung, uh, hanging in the background. I have exact same one. Um, I was gonna yeah. turn my lip. Here we go. Every film has <laughs> wanted to <laughs> share something. <laughs> um, Present I'm sure everyone who's listening here, uh, at least half of the Uyghurs in the diaspora have a rug like that in their yeah. in their household. <laughs> So that's both our way to, you know, try to be connected. At least we can see it's usually look, the rug is usually hung in, in the dining room area. So every day when you are eating your Uyghur food, speaking your Uyghur language, you are looking at your Uyghur rug. And that is a rug. It's it's a very well known. Um, Let me lighten up. You can see. Uh, yes. It's very beautiful. And it, it is the image of um, the 12 muqam. Uh, um, people who are playing the traditional Uyghur instruments in the background. So, yeah, if people just search online, if you write 12 Muqam Uyghur, you will be able to find this um, uh, clear picture. And, um, yeah, I've tried uh, to do all kinds of ways. I make Uyghur friends. I've I've met more Uyghur friends in the United States than when I was in, when I was in Beijing. So... Yeah, I've tried to do all kinds of things to, you know, to connect myself to my roots. And um, I also listen to Uyghur music and dance Uyghur dances, even though I know the Chinese government have been portraying the Uyghurs as the dance machines who always happily dance in front of uh, the cameras and we're living happily forever, even though we're going through, you know, um, repression. Uh, but I still do not want the Chinese government to, you know, use all kinds of uh, their tactics to, um, to, 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 to be, to make the Uyghurs be a part of, uh, to, to be a part, part away from our, you know, culture, our, our religion, our all kinds of things that we grew up loving and connected to. So I try all kinds of things, and they also brings brings my heart at peace as well. Whenever I think I am not making progress, whenever I think, oh, I'm not saving enough people, whenever I, I think that my advocacy <clears throat> might, not, might not matter, might not making a, a contribution to the cause, I listen to more, um, we were a podcast on radios, watch more videos and we were, uh, in Uyghur languages, and then it motivates me more. It makes me want to keep going every day. Mm -hmm. That that's beautiful. If you could type out on the chat the name of the rug you were both referencing, uh, for anyone who might want to look it up, that'd be uh, that'd be great. Thanks. Um, and yeah, you you've uh, brought up the issue of how Chinese state media sometimes portrays Uyghurs as very happy and not concerned at all by all these atrocities that are still going on. Um, and in fact, you you find that because of that whole narrative living in the West, you'll find some people who are skeptical of the Uyghur issue, which is very 
uh, disappointing. But I'd love to hear from the three of you if you've had any experience running into uh, that kind of perspective into people who are skeptical of the issue and uh, if you fa faced pushback and how you've dealt with it, uh, how you move forward and convince someone that, yeah, this is happening, this is happening to me right now. And please, any of you feel feel free uh, <laughs> to speak up on that. Um, I can start uh, just really briefly. Um, I think it's because there's such different levels of um, incarceration and oppression that Uyghurs are facing back in the Uyghur region that there are some skepticism, right? They think that they see a lot of Uyghurs in, uh, like Jia said, Beijing or Shanghai or in the outskirts of China outside of the Uyghur region that are getting educated in these other boarding schools or whatnot. And they're like, well, I have an Uyghur friend and she's fine and she's not, you know, in a, in a camp. And they think that this idea makes it okay. Um, but the thing is, the Uyghur issue is there's multiple layers to it, right? There are those millions that are stuck in the camps that are having to report to the police station all the time, that are having to you know, live under constant surveillance. But even those that aren't at that level, at that very core genocide level, they are still being psychologically intimidated. They are forced to report to the police station on their whereabouts, where they are. Their passports are taken so that traveling outside of China is virtually impossible for them. And so just because you see one or two outliers, that doesn't mean that there isn't oppression happening to them at a certain level. That um, because they are able to speak Chinese fluently because they've been educated since they were very young, does not mean that they're not facing oppression at a way that you can't physically see. Um, and I think that's really important to highlight to those people who don't believe it because there's also a lot of animosity between Han Chinese, a lot of trust issues between Han Chinese and Uyghurs. So a lot of the times it's the Han Chinese that are within China that are denying this and um, because they have one or two Uyghur friends and they're saying, well, I have an Uyghur friend and it's not happening to them. But you don't know that because of this uh, distrust that was in, that was forced by the government, essentially, from a very, very, very young age. These Uyghurs, they grow up not trusting it. They can't speak their stories. They can't talk about, oh, well, I can't talk to my family members every day and tell them what's in my heart because of what's happening. They, they can't say these things to anybody. And I think it's really important to recognize that, that this oppression, it's a lot more complex, a lot more layered than what we really think it is. It's not China gathering up a million Uyghurs and putting them into a chamber, um, but it's, it's, it's high tech. It's monitoring their every action. Imagine how differently you would act if you knew that a slight phrase might get you in trouble. Uh, you, and you don't even know what phrase that might be. It might be assalamu alaikum. It might be, you know, something very, very, you know, saying, oh, like uh, Xi Jinping is looks like Winnie the Pooh, like saying that kind of phrase might get you in trouble. And uh, imagine how differently you would act. And I think that in itself is a very, very psychologically um, intimidating aspect that we need to take out to those that deny it, that say that, oh, well, I have one Uber friend who's not in a camp. Um, it's China is much more complex than that, much smarter. They've, they've learned from, you know, the Holocaust. They've learned from the past genocides and how the countries are reacting. They they recognize that they can make allies with countries that are also willing to commit the same atrocities um, and l use those countries as a validation that they're not doing anything wrong, but at the same time using high-end technology to continue. Um, I just want to add into what Iraga just uh, mentioned. Um, also, I'd like to remind people the level of censorship in China, it is, um, I don't know what <laughs> words that I can even describe it with. Uh, there's, it's incomparable compared to um, the, the rest of the world. Um, just, uh, just, just a small anecdote. I had, I was luckily, I had a chance to speak with my, some of my relatives in the Uyghur region a couple months ago and over the phone. Um, when they used to be uh, um, either hijabis or people who would regularly um, uh, observe is Islam and, and, and follow uh, um, Islamic practices. But when I greeted them, 
I forgot. I simply just forgot. I was too excited and I simply forgot to be careful with my words. And I said, I greeted them with assalamu alaikum. That is a normal greetings between the, uh, between the Muslim people all around the world. They immediately freaked out and, 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 and they, they started saying ni hao, ni hao, ni hao. And most of the people who, even though you don't speak Chinese, you might know ni hao means hello in Chinese. They didn't even say yaksham, they said ni hao, ni hao, ni hao. And uh, when I also forgot again, I said Allah amanet. They freaked out again and started saying Xi Jinping amanet, party amanet. So Allah amanet means Allah wish you peace. And instead of saying Allah wish you peace, now they would they have changed the term to uh, Xi Jinping will wish you peace or Chen Quan will wish you peace, which is the you know as uh, um, Chen Quan is the head of the the new. Uh, appointed a uh, bureau, bureau for the Uyghur region, and or they would say Party Ramanet, which is the Communist Party wish you peace. And that's a level of fear people are living in. You cannot even <laughs> greet people like normal human beings anymore. And also, I have spoken with a Chinese friend. I was, I would, I did, I also forgot that Winnie the Pooh reminds people of Xi Jinping, and I just said, oh, the uh the Winnie the Pooh uh cartoon was really really cute. I I I can't remember the exact context, but it was something totally unrelated to politics. And that message, she never received it. I received a red mark next to it, and I tried sending it three four times, and it was always uh, uh shown as a red mark next to it. So it was never delivered. I had to take a screenshot and send it to her, and she said, "Yeah, it's not allowed." And when I said freedom of expression, the word, the phrase was also censored out. So that's the level of uh, level of censorship censorship in China. <clears throat> Imagine saying, "I have family relatives are locked up in concentration camps." What would what would those Uyghur people face? Uh, yeah. what, would, what would they be suffer? How, what kind of outcomes will will lead to them? Yeah, I just wanted to share those little anecdotes. Mm -hmm. Um, I just wanna you know um give an example about what i experienced recently uh, on friday um april 9 2021 chinese government has issued uh, a press release where they uh, featured multiple uh, video clips of relatives of some of the uyghur activists uh, abroad who was speaking about the camp, who is raising wars uh, for their relatives being locked, on, uh, locked in in the concentration camp. One of the video uh, segments was about my family and me. Uh, in this video, our relatives were forced to speak against us. I couldn't see my mother and uh, my brothers uh, <clears throat> Uh, face in from 2016. Finally, I saw the, from this video. I'm happy about that. Uh, but they forced to speak against me. Uh, in the report, the Chinese government claims that on May 8, 2017, Chinese security agency put me, a US-based Radio Free Asia journalist, on their wanted list as a terrorist for the participating in a terrorist organization. The Chinese government is also accusing me uh, of lies and the criticizing, uh, criticizing me for the participating in the U.S. congressional hearing and the meeting with the uh, former U.S. Uh, Secretary of uh, State Mike Pompeo. Uh, <clears throat> the report also says that my parents are not able to travel because of their poor health and medical condition, and they and therefore they have no intention of going abroad. That is completely lie. Uh, for years, my parents have been denied passports by the Chinese government for a very specific reason. <clears throat> Retaliation against me uh, for my journalism here in US 
The report also falsely claims that my parents have been living a normal life. But the reality is ever since I came to the United States 2001, my family become the target and uh, they've been harassed, uh, criticism, uh, victim of the concentration camp system. Is that the normal life? This attack on us, US citizens, by the Chinese government are um, outrageous and unacceptable. So they can attack me as a international journalist. So can you imagine others? So, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's an absolutely uh, great point. Uh, and my condolences for everything you, most of you have gone through in terms of relationships with your family. It's actually a great segue into one of the audience questions we have, which is how do you combat the smear campaigns that the Chinese government conducts against you or your family members? How can you combat that? Combat that? And how can people outside of China and the West show solidarity and help you while you're doing so? So, um, for Uyghurs, the hope, the belief is very important. Mm, you know, the... My mother always told me that we can lose everything except our, except our uh, determination not to lose our goal. The goal keeps us alive. Even in suffering and despair, we worse are suffering, but we can end this intensified um, repression. Um, that started only, um, you know, four years ago when China thought it could get away with uh, it while the world would keep silence. But we will not be silenced. <laughs> and the, um, though slow to be awakened, uh, the whole world will soon refuse to allow China to silence its actions any longer. So um, in Uyghur language, um, Uyghurs call two things with name of mother, motherland and mother tongue. Uh, in their uh, per uh, perception, uh, the mother is a symbol of life. Um, prosperity and um, sacredness. Uh, the mother is the source of love and um, sacrifice for great causes. So I'm not only the journals, I'm also a mother. So I need to teach my children how to keep that goal. Um, so as uh, Johar says, our language is very beautiful. We're proud of our language. If we, you know, use any um, chance to speak, we need to keep our language alive, keep our belief alive, keep our goals alive, keep our, you know, the hope alive. So that's um, the encouragement from inside, you know, what my mother taught me. So I believe we're gonna continue generation to generation, keep our goal. I'd like to add, I think um, sure. one of the things uh, based on what Gilgeka just said, uh, working with the next generation of Uyghur kids, especially uh, this situation, the while China and the Communist Party is continuing to try to stamp out the Uyghur identity uh, within the Uyghurs and the Uyghur youth in, in East Turkestan, um, they set a fire in the hearts of the young people in the diaspora, the Uyghurs in the diaspora. There is a 
reemergence of wanting to connect with their culture. I'm seeing, you know, little five, six year olds more excited than ever to learn about their Uyghur culture. These 12 year olds who are, you know, talking about Uyghur history and talking about what's happening. And these are 12, 13 year olds. This is this is what the Chinese Communist Party unknowingly did. They took a diaspora of children who were confused about their identity and made that feeling even stronger to know their identity. And I think that's really important to point out. Um, and then in regards to the question of what do we do on the smear campaigns, we continue to tell our stories. We continue to speak out. Yes. And um, I think those that aren't you know, necessarily Uyghur, that doesn't mean that they can't either. They need to continue to say, hey, we don't believe this, what you're saying. And if you guys have seen some of the propaganda, it's very tone deaf, right? We're talking about the cotton issue, for example, when um, there was a whole uprise in speaking about the uh, forced labor <clears throat> of the cotton issue. They released a video of Uyghurs dancing with cotton in their hands. That's very tone deaf. That's very, uh, it doesn't make sense. So it's just recognizing these things that why would you want to further this like very false, very overplayed, very, uh, very exaggerated view. And then on top of that, when they were attacking Uyghur women, Uyghur activists who had escaped the camps, they attacked these women on a very, very inappropriate level. These officials, Chinese officials were attacking these women saying that, you know, essentially very um, inhumanely, very, you know, something that like attacks the womanhood of the uh, their womanhood. And I think this, again, very tone deaf, very sexist in a lot of ways. And I think um, we need to recognize that we need to continue to write about it. And just not just Uyghurs, but non Uyghurs can also write about this and say, look, like, these aren't believable. We need to see those signs of where they're crossing the line and say that, as, especially as public officials, these are not things that you should be saying. These are not things that you should be representing. This is completely inappropriate. And our politicians need to recognize that. And we need to stop giving room for these, uh, for Chinese Communist Party politicians to speak and say those kinds of things, to allow them to spread this propaganda. So this puts reliance on companies, social media companies as well, like uh, Twitter, like Facebook, and um, anybody who has that, uh, you know, like Reddit, anyone who has this platform where the propaganda can continue, the, that's the responsibility of them, is to put a stop to that, to flag it as false information, to flag it as uh, propaganda, and to make sure that these are being pointed out for what they are, right? False information. Um, and this misinformation, disinformation campaigns, they need to be painted as such. And so this puts the responsibility on um, companies and even the United Nations who have given them platforms, they need to, you know, maybe put out a little reminder that this is the Chinese Communist Party spreading propaganda of a internationally recognized genocide is what we need to, mm -hmm. what we need to make sure that we're labeling this as. Yes. Yeah. Uh, to, to help Uyghurs, you don't have to be Uyghurs today because this issue is not only Uyghur crisis. This is genocide in in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. So we living in the same world, same century. Mm -hmm. I love the Mike Pompeo were saying that what Chinese government doing to the Uyghur people is the biggest stain in the 21st century. This stain will stay in your history, every person's history. So just be a human mm -hmm. to recognize mm -hmm. this issue, how important you all can have a rule, you know, what kind of rule you cannot take, it's up to you. But mm -hmm. you cannot wash out this darkness stay in mm -hmm. the 21st century. That's why we need to work together. We need to break silence together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's that's very well put. Thank you. And um, we're about to move towards the closing remarks for the entire uh, event we have here our next speaker, who is uh, Dr. Victoria timbor Ui, who is an associate professor of political science at Notre Dame University, um, as well as an expert uh, in the field. So she'll be uh, joining us for the closing remarks after one last question for 
uh, all of you, uh, starting with uh, Joe Hat. I want to know how optimistic you all are about the future of the Uber community. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd just love to hear your thoughts on the future of the Uber community on what we can do to ensure that it's a bright future. Uh, thank you. I just shared a link to the chat section. It's the website for the coalition to end Uber Force Labor. And for anyone who is interested in contributing positively to the cause, you may uh, visit this website. You will you will see different uh, tabs and sections. You will be able to find for people who don't know enough. You can simply check the news section where there are all the news articles are related to this uh, to this cause. And for people who are interested, which of the Western brands or brands in 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 in, uh, in um, in the international uh, in global which brands in Western, uh, which Western brands, sorry, my English is not helping today, which Western brands are complicit in the Uyghur, um, Uyghur forced labor scheme. Uh, you'll, you can find it from the brands tab. And for people who are interested in uh, after, after learning uh, which brands uh, are being complicit and after learning about what is really happening and who are willing to take specific actions, you can take, uh, you can visit the related actions tab where there are specific uh, action items such as petitions, webinars, and letters that are, for example, sending it to Apple's um, CEO, Tim Cruz, and also there are different uh, petitions. It doesn't matter if you're based in UK, US, or Australia, there are different petitions that are uh, just assigned for different countries. And for people who are who are willing to learn about uh, what are which brands have uh, chose to stand on the right side of the history, who that chose to be ethical, you also can find it, uh, find the list of brands from the brands tab. Uh, for example, ASOS, Island Fisher, Marks and Spencer, those brands have uh, have all uh, committed to the call to action, which is the brand's commitment to exit the Uber region because they do not want, no longer want to be, uh, be part of the forced labor and do not want to be part of the crimes against humanity anymore. So please uh, visit this website if you're interested. And yeah, they can give you basically everything you need to know. <laughs> great, great. That that's great for anyone watching. That's in the link, uh, in the links in the chat. Um, okay. Uh, so, uh, Irada or Ultara, if either of you want to share some quick final thoughts, uh, yeah, you've got three minutes that we're on time for our closing statements. So please go ahead. Please do. <laughs> yeah, uh, I just I just pointed I was uh, trying to answer some of the questions we didn't get to. Um, and I think one of the biggest uh, that I, I really did want to highlight is what you know the Chinese community uh, abroad can also do. And one of the biggest tools that you guys have is the fact that you're Chinese speakers, that you do have a connection to mainland China. And I think um, continuing to spread this idea of what is happening to, to educate more and more people, especially within the Chinese community, uh, I think is extremely important. Um, because, you know, I, I'm a big believer that without, uh, you know, fellow Chinese kind of coming into this idea, without uh, the Chinese community within China also supporting the Uyghurs and supporting, um, you know, or speaking out against the government, there's not gonna be a lot of change. Um, and I think uh, that's extremely important. The other is um, that there are a lot of campaigns happening right now for Uyghurs, which is, and as Jao had mentioned, there's the forced labor um, because that's one proponent. The other is uh, trying to put out more documentation. You know, if you're a Chinese speaker, trying to uh, find documentation um, in, in Chinese media and Chinese uh, social media and uh, providing that, translating that, sharing that, uh, it provides a lot of uh, evidence for researchers, a lot of connections that they can make based on their own research. And then of course, uh, supporting many of the organizations uh, from World Uyghur Congress to the Uyghur American Association, Campaign for Uyghurs, uh, Uyghur Human Rights Project, and then Radio Free Asia can also always, you know, sharing Radio Free Asia's uh, reporting and whatnot, uh, I think they're extremely important. And as always, continuing to educate more and more people. <clears throat> so as a journalist, I cannot, you know, encourage anybody to some kind of activism. So as a journalist, um, I welcome you 
to visit our website rfa.org so we we not just spending our time to provide those news we are we are spending our life risk our life risk our whole family member to provide those news to you just for you to read just for you to learn what is really going on in the Uyghur region. So we will happy. And uh, we encourage by your attention, actually. So I welcome everybody to pay attention to our news, our work. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks uh, to the three of you, Gultara, Irada, and Johad for participating and being here today with us. And thank you for all your work in this area and for the, the personal cost uh, you've, you've paid for it. Um, yeah, uh, and now I'd like to thank our sponsors, our co-sponsoring organizations, the Human Rights Foundation, obviously, Harvard University's Human Rights Working Group, the Harvard Law School Advocates for Human Rights, the Jewish Movement for Equal Freedom, and the Travi Chat for supporting us uh, throughout all these panels. Um, and without further ado, I'm gonna hand things off to uh, Associate Professor of Notre Dame University, uh, Victoria Timbor Uy, who will be giving some closing remarks uh, for, this, for this event. Thanks again. Well, thank <clears throat> you so much for everyone, especially the last panel. Um, I think that, you know, when it, whenever you use the word genocide, I, I remember just recently that the in communist article talks about, you know, maybe we shouldn't use the word. Because once you use the word, what do you do? We, the world once promised ourselves that we, we should never again have experience genocide. Just the ridiculous thing is that the world has actually managed to do that by looking the other way. You know, when you say never again, well, then we don't see it. So we don't, we can just kind of pretend it doesn't happen. In a way that I think, so as someone speaking from Hong Kong, as someone from Hong Kong that the, the um, anti-extradition protests of 2019 really made it impossible for the world to look the other way about all of China's human rights abuses and the great atrocities. And in turn, then the weaker situation has also helped to garner attention to what is going on in Hong Kong and to the points that today we have this multi-alliance and Hong Kong people also were talking about today's Xinjiang to most Hong Kong because how do you silence the majority? One thing is that you try to impose total assimilation to make sure that they all become to look like these happy Chinese. And then at the same time, how do we then, you know, when we talk about uh, there was a long list of uh, all of these businesses that it is important to put pressure on them so that they stop sponsoring the Asian Olympic Games. It seems that it may also be very important to make sure that these companies do not really have to choose between human rights and um, doing something good for humanity and taking action against genocide in Xinjiang. One way is, I suppose, is I'm, maybe we should learn lessons from other kind of boycott movements. One thing is the Jewish, uh, the liberal Jewish uh, uh, campaign about BDS, boycott, divestment, and sanctions. And also another campaign that we all often have overlooked is also the South African struggle in the 1980s. There was a divestment campaign. A lot of Americans actually lobby the US government and lobby different businesses to divest from South Africa. And across the United States, different campuses also help protest, pressuring the administration to, to divest from different stocks that continue to, of, of these businesses that continue to run in South Africa. So some of these actions are important to make sure that for these businesses, whether it is Airbnb or Nike or Coca-Cola, we think twice, you know, maybe actually doing good is also good for my pockets. And then at the same time, it is also important, just as um, the Radio Free Asia journalists just said that they risk their life, they also do um, jeopardize their family members in order to put out these stories. I think that those stories are very important. Again, when it comes to human rights, just too many people will look at human rights policy. Should British foreign policy, should the EU foreign policy prioritize human rights over uh, business trade interests? It is very important that we put faces to human rights abuses 
if we are not talking about human rights abuses, if we are not talking about human rights abuses, so even genocide in any abstract terms, that there are these faces, that there are all these real life stories that people can relate to. So we continue to work toward building alliances put faces to what is going on in the peripheries among all the minorities in China. And at the same time, build alliances. It is definitely just as important to expand the multi alliance and also to work with other Chinese to then, um, both from top down and bottom up, that we can maybe save some lives. So thank you so much for coming to this conference. Look forward to seeing you guys. Thank you, Dr. Hui, for those closing remarks. And thank you all for joining us for these important conversations. Thank you to our incredible speakers who helped us gain a better understanding about these crimes against humanity and the genocide that is happening within the Uyghur region. Thank you to our co-sponsors, Harvard University's Human Rights Working Group, Harvard Law School Advocates for Human Rights, the Jewish Movement for Uyghur Freedom, the Tribute and Harvard Kennedy School Carr Center for Human Rights Policy. Thank you to my fellow HRF colleague, Gus, for handling the backend tech for this platform, Crowdcast, and for helping us through any and all technical difficulties. The Human Rights Foundation remains committed to prom promoting and protecting human rights in countries where they are most at risk. Together, we must continue these conversations about human rights and about freedom and we must continue to highlight the truth. We are witnessing a genocide right now in the 21st century. We can and we must demand accountability and urge the Chinese government to close the camps, to release all the detainees and to respect fundamental human rights. We can all play a role in ending these crimes through various ways as our panelists shared, whether that be calling your legislators taking to social media, sharing these stories, and pressing your favorite fashion brands to no longer be complicit. We must not let the CCP's propaganda machine, such as social media and in academic institutions, and even in Hollywood, to wash over and silence the truth. Once again, thank you all for joining. Stay engaged by following us on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook at HRF Human Rights Foundation. Thank you so much. Take care.